Nice to see you all. I'm Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Law School Library. On behalf of the library, I'd like to welcome you here today for our, our lunch book talk. Just uh, some housekeeping things to be aware of. We are recording today's talk, including the question and answer section, and that will be put up on our YouTube page sometime next week, most likely. Um, today's talk is by... Um, some people's favorite faculty member, Professor Cass Sunstein, who is the Robert Walmsley University Professor and sort of pertinent to this particular book, um, the founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy. Professor Sunstein is here today to discuss his book, The Ethics of Influence, Government in the Age of Behavioral um, science, and just a personal note, I've been thinking a lot about this as we're entering the presidential election, and so not necessarily just in terms of government influence, but influence in general on our behavior and how we engage with the government. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Without further ado, Professor Sunstein. Thank you. Okay, great. It's uh, a thrill to be here, n not least because this book is just out, and it's many years in the making, and uh, I feel I've made more than zero progress on the issues, but uh, less than complete progress. I'll tell you the secret origin of the project. Uh, uh, there was a conference in Berlin a number of years ago, um, which was an occasion for investigating issues of ethics connected with imposition of influence, especially by government. And what was informative about the conference in Berlin was the acute sensitivity to manipulation by government. And given the history, uh, not only Nazism, but I think even more East Germany, uh, the kind of level of focus and um, uh, intensely productive engagement with ethical constraints on what government does was an eye-opener for me. And so while the idea of um, ethics of choice architecture is something that a number of us have worked on for a decade or so, this really intensified that focus. Um, and so that's what you're gonna hear a little bit about. So here's a story from David Foster Wallace. Uh, two little fish, are, and they're young as well as small. They're swimming and they meet an older fish swimming the other way. And the older fish says, morning boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on and then eventually one looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? Now, the reason this is a behavioral science study is that all of us are surrounded by the equivalent of water and for many of us, uh, we are oblivious to it. So the fact that the sandwiches provided for today are in uh, a particular order where the vegetarian ones were first, uh, that's like water. They have to be, and, and it's predictable that more of you are having uh, vegetarian meals than otherwise would because of the uh, seemingly invisible ordering effect of what you see first. In fact, there's a very improbable finding of the power of choice architecture from the economics profession, where the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, sends out uh, working papers every week, 15 or 20 working papers every week, they're in a particular order. And economists, you know, they know what they're interested in, they know who's good, so if you see there's a paper by someone who's got a Nobel Prize, you should click on it, and if it's in your area of interest, you should click on that too. If it's by someone who you've never heard of or on a topic that bores you not. So you might think that the order effects in which the papers are arrived in your inbox should be irrelevant to what's downloaded. Not so. The choice architecture of the order of the National Bureau of Economic Research papers has a very significant effect on what papers get downloaded. That shouldn't be true, but it is true. The order effect is like water. Okay, so uh, there are two ideas, libertarian paternalism, which means uh, influences that preserve freedom of choice, but that steer people in particular directions, and choice architecture, which is uh, water writ large, 
Uh, these are often very inexpensive for the private and public sector, typically they are, and they have potentially massive effects on well-being. It's to be hoped favorable, though possibly unfavorable. So what we're observing is worldwide interest. Uh, Qatar has just announced that it's the first Middle Eastern country that's creating uh, a nudge unit. Uh, they are uh, all over Europe, Australia, has won the United States, the United Kingdom, of course, and there's interest emerging in Africa and, and Asia. Okay, so we're going to look at two principal foundations, welfare and autonomy, with some material on dignity and self-government. Our master concept will be welfare and autonomy, thinking of those as uh, central to uh, the best philosophical traditions in terms of what governments ethically do. Uh, you may have noticed there's a five on that list that isn't going to be discussed, and that's justice. Uh, the reason justice isn't on the list is that uh, its relationship to thinking about influences, I think, is very complicated and potentially less productive than appears in the sense that any tool can produce justice or injustice. A mandate can do that. A tax incentive can do that. Uh, a, uh, an effort to persuade people can do that. But it isn't intrinsic to the tool that it raises a problem for one of, of justice. It's kind of the thing the tool does. Uh, whereas I think on these four issues, it's a little more tractable to think about whether the tool is offending the thing. OK, so, so here are four conclusions. It's pointless to object to choice architecture and to nudging as such. Uh, whether nudges um, in cold days, people will make different choices than on warm days. Um, if a website has certain items listed in prominent places, uh, it will nudge people. Uh, the layout of an office will nudge. So to find that objectionable is a little um, uh, unhelpful in the sense that any website or office has to have a choice architecture. That can't be avoided. The government, insofar as it has any programs at all, will have choice architecture. And so the question is whether the choice architecture itself is objectionable, not its existence. Uh, ethical abstractions can be a recipe for confusion. Nudging takes diverse forms. So the great William Blake, in his priceless marginalia on Sir Joshua Reynolds, uh, he's writing these mar notes in the margin to the great artist, uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds, and, uh, and Blake writes, uh, Reynolds was a great fan of generalization and abstraction. And uh, Blake wrote, to generalize is to be an idiot. I thank God I am not like Reynolds. Uh, and that, that's not quite fair, but it's basically right. <laughs> OK, so if welfare is our guide, much nudging is actually mandatory on ethical grounds. And the, the same thing is true of autonomy. So I want to take uh, our two ethical foundations as uh, reasons for applause for at least certain forms of nudging. OK, so for orientation, we need some examples. This is an effort to particularize. Blake also said particulariza particularization is the alone distinction of true merit. That's itself a generalization, so it's a little bit of a problem, but uh, hooray for Blake still. OK, default rules are uh, nudges. Um, if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in any country, automatically enroll people in green energy sources with easy opt-out. That has a very significant effect, even though it's completely preserving of freedom of choice. If you want to do something about poverty in the United States beyond what's been done, uh, automatically enroll people in anti-poverty programs for which they have to sign up. Automatic enrollment can have a very significant effect. Uh, simplification, we're near a presidential election. There are sprouting up little forms that allow you online to register to vote in basically 12 seconds. And that massively increases uh, uh, the ease of voting and increases voter registration. Uh, information disclosure, warnings, and reminders are influences. 
Reminders are the sleeper on this list. The data is coming in that they are extremely effective and uh, usually very inexpensive. And the reason is they overcome uh, the behavioral phenomenon of limited attention. They, they trigger attention. OK, so here are uh, five more. Increases in ease and convenience, uses of social norms. Uh, I have a uh, person I follow on Twitter who is, I've never met him. He wrote a very good book on behavioral finance. Uh, and he tweets very frequently. Uh, my book is doing great and much better than expectations. Thank you for the support. So far as I can tell, his book is doing terribly. No one's buying it. Though it's probably doing better than expectations. It's a pretty technical book. It's a smart tweet. He is enlisting social norms uh, to try to uh, increase sales. Uh, Prime Minister Cameron in the UK had an early initiative to reduce tax delinquency in the UK, by which, and this was tested empirically, letters were sent to delinquent taxpayers uh, notifying them that they were in a small group of people in their community who weren't paying their taxes on time, and that uh, upped uh, tax compliance quite significantly. Uh, the UK recently did this to try to reduce overprescription of antibiotics, a uh, potentially very serious public health problem. And what the UK uh, Behavioral Insights team did was to send to the doctors who are big prescribers, you are in a group of people who prescribe more than your peers, you might want to think about coming in line with your peers. And the result of that was to reduce in a six month period prescriptions by 76,000. Okay, non-monetary awards, rewards, active choosing is a nudge. Pre-commitment strategies are a nudge. The sleeper on this list is active choosing. I think we're gonna see a lot more efforts to devise choice architecture to ask people whether they want to do X that increases the incidence of X. Okay, uh, so active choosing can indeed be best. Choice architecture should be transparent and subject to scrutiny. It must not be undertaken for illicit ends. And it's really important to distinguish between the third qualification and objections to nudging or choice architecture as such. Okay, so we might be concerned about rights, autonomy, dignity, respect for persons, and learning. Um, okay, so what we're trying to do most of the time is influence choices in a way that will make choosers better off as judged by themselves. Uh, that is usually pretty simple. Uh, not always, and we can talk a little bit about why it might not be simple. It might be that the chooser's judgment about what is better is endogenous to the choice architecture, in which case you can't choose choice architecture by asking what people think makes them better off, because what they think makes them better off depends on what choice architecture was chosen. But it's still the lodestar. It's a, it's a measure of people's own assessments rather than the choice architect's assessment. Okay. So legal systems can't avoid nudging. Lawyers and doctors are in the nudging business. Your cell phone is nudging you. So is an electronic store or a website. Of these, probably the ones to underline for present purposes are lawyers and doctors. Any presentation of options will have uh, some sort of choice architecture in it, what's listed first, what's described as the standard approach. And that often will have a massive effect on outcomes. OK, we now know that human beings make systematic errors, not in the sense that they're irrational. The association of behavioral science with the word irrational should be excised. Uh, the word irrational does not describe what's found. It's instead that people are boundedly rational. Sometimes they are unrealistically optimistic. Sometimes people are focused on the present and not the future. Um, with respect to unrealistic optimism, I'll give you a little data that's uh, consistent with it and shows the same mechanism. Think for a moment, if you would, you don't have to tell me or anyone else, uh, how good looking you think you are on a scale of zero to 10. What would you rank yourself? <laughs> now imagine that someone who you kind of trust, who's outside this room, has been asked the question how good looking you are, 
and actually that person thinks, and the person is pretty trustworthy, that you're a few notches better looking than you think, that you lowballed yourself. Now imagine you're asked, how good looking are you, given that information? Typically, people will show an uptick, given the information they've received from the objective, reliable outsider. Now imagine that you have gotten unfortunate information where the reliable person has downgraded your looks compared to you by two notches. You might think you're a seven, the person actually says five, the person's kind of reliable. The question is, are you gonna go down? The answer is no, you won't. People show more receptivity towards good news about their own looks, their own prospects, their own health, their own susceptibility to bad events than to bad news. That's a systematic bias, the good news, bad news effect. Okay, um, uh, there's a kind of plea against nudges from Aldous Huxley's masterpiece, Brave New World, which you can see as a world where uh, people are surrounded by comfortable defaults, and the response is, I don't want comfort, I want God, I want poetry, I want real danger, I want freedom, I want goodness, I want sin. And that's a claim for active choosing rather than comfort. Okay, so we might be worried about infantilization or about harm. Uh, and the question is, when do these objections make sense? So if we bring the abstractions in context of particular forms of choice architecture, and I mean this to be a rhetorical question, are the objections with respect to infantilization or harm plausible when people are asked to say what they want? Don't think so. That's not infantilizing. When people are given information about the nutritional content of food, it's hard to create an ethical objection to that, isn't it? When people are reminded of an appointment or a bill, you could think that's treating me like a baby, but you could think, thank you, I forgot. It would be hard to object, I think, under non-exotic circumstances to a reminder that you have an appointment this afternoon. Uh, what about when you're presented with a default rule? Default rule is, at Harvard, that unless you say something different, you're going to be in a pension plan, 401k plan, it has the following features, and your contribution rate is gonna increase from one year to the next. Is that infantilizing or is that helpful? Probably helpful. Okay, to get a little clearer on the domain of influence that we're talking about, a GPS is a device is a canonical form of influence in the sense that it is telling you how to get in the direction you want to go. It's respectful of your end, um, but it steers you. There's no question that it steers you. This is uh, an instructive, though somewhat scandalous influence. It's a urinal, but it's not just any urinal. It's the urinal at the Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands. There's a fly painted on the urinal the reason for the fly is to reduce spillage. The consequence of the fly is to reduce spillage by 44%. Don't ask me who figured that out. I'm glad I don't know. Apparently men can't help but aim at the fly. Uh, the reason it's instructive as well as helpful with an admittedly modest public health issue is that the, uh, the fly uh, makes salient something that otherwise wouldn't be so salient, which is aim kinda there. Okay, here's a, a cho choice architecture intervention, which is the new USDA food plate. It's really quite parallel to the fly. It says, if you want to have a healthy meal, make half your plate fruits and vegetables. Bracket the question whether this is the ideal um, uh, influence for such choices, and just notice that it's, it's an effort, it's like a GPS. Okay, that's the old USDA food pyramid. That's supposed to do the same thing, but notice, if you would, it's extremely confusing. Okay, so do nudges work? Here's an effort to catalog four ideas. 
uh, automatic enrollment and savings plans in, the, in Denmark has had a larger effect than significant tax incentives. The US government has responded big time to data of this kind, and we see efforts to incentivize automatic enrollment. There's a credit card law which is saving uh, billions of dollars annually, in part through influences that give people information about the cost of overuse fees, uh, the magnitude of overuse fees, and late fees. Uh, there's a home energy report many people get, which tells people how their energy use compares to that of their neighbors. The consequence of the home energy report is to produce conservation equivalent to an 8 to 20 percent spike in the cost of electricity. So that little report is working like a significant price incentive. And financial aid sim form simplification is equivalent to a several thousand dollar increase in the subsidy. Okay, we can imagine choice architecture in many, many domains. Okay, you might worry about paternalism. And insofar as we're speaking of uh, the GPS device, it's a form of libertarian paternalism, meaning it's choice preserving paternalism. We might think that for a certain category of influences, the right word is navigability. And I think there's a lot of work to be done on navigability as a tool of influence. That is, an airport can be navigable or not, so to a website, so to an interaction with an authority. And increases in navigability are, it's hard to question them as uh, unethical. Still, there is paternalism in some of these interventions. If welfare is the master concept or autonomy is the master concept, there's an easy justification for an assortment of these tools, isn't there, that they are autonomy promoting and welfare increasing. So there the objection seems puzzling from the standpoint of paternalism, even if there's an effort to steer. Okay, the case of autonomy is a little more interesting. And I'm feeling slightly stung on this because there's a lengthy review in, stung in a pleasant way, like a little pinch, because there's a review in the New Republic of this book that says it didn't get into the deepest philosophical issues. Let's get a little deeper into them, shall we? Uh, <laughs> Uh, suppose we are Kantians and we believe that people should be authors of the narratives of their own lives. And we believe that not because we think that promotes welfare, it might not, but because it exemplifies a principle of respect for persons. People should be ends, not means. They aren't part of any maximization machinery. Okay, then if we have that kind of Kantian foundation, We'd agree, wouldn't we, that autonomy doesn't require active choosing everywhere. In fact, active choosing everywhere would be autonomy reducing, big time. That your relationship with your employer or your health insurance provider or your cell phone company or your computer would quickly overwhelm you if you were making choices everywhere. So another way to put it is that people often choose not to choose or would if they were informed and even to ask them to choose under circumstances in which they haven't said they don't want to is an intrusion on their ability to manage their own time and to set their own priorities. In fact, it can be a significant intrusion on mental bandwidth, which is part of the way that people it's something people manage in order to preserve their autonomy. This is something that Kant and Mill didn't really engage. Kant's non-engagement of the issue isn't so surprising. Mill's a little bit. But the idea is that uh, uh, choosing has a very complex relationship with autonomy. And relief of the choice-making obligation under specified circumstances is doubly autonomy promoting. It's doubly autonomy promoting because it reflects people's judgments, and it also is autonomy promoting because it allows people to devote their attention to their deepest concerns. If you've ever been in a cab to the airport and the cab driver asks you, what route would you like me to take? And you've reacted aversely to that question, then you're on to the point. 
Who, who loves that question? Maybe some people? Experts in how to get to the airport? But it's, a little, it's like a little cognitive and hedonic tax, that question. Okay, manipulation. There's a widespread concern that certain forms of influence, and intruding some nudges, can be manipulative. Okay, the, the book has a, a chapter, a very, um, uh, what is it, very uh, agitated chapter called Fifty Shades of Manipulation. There's also a book with Fifty Shades. There's no, no reference was intended to that Fifty Shades. But there are 50, at least 50 shades of manipulation. And we need some sort of definition. Uh, a working definition of manipulation, it's very hard to come up with one, by the way, that captured ordinary intuitions and isn't confounded by examples. But uh, uh, one that won't be confounded by examples but has the uh, vice of vagueness is that an act is manipulative if it appeals unduly to uh, 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 to people's automatic intuitive processing and doesn't sufficiently engage their deliberative or re reflective processing. I think that captures the ordinary language notion of manipulation. If you tell someone to do something, not by deceiving them, but by engaging their emotions with, without appealing to their reflective capacities, that probably is, captures what we mean by a manipulative act. And the objection to manipulation is first, it doesn't treat people with respect, because we're not engaging their reflective capacities. And second, it threatens to diminish welfare, because we're not asking them to make the choices on their own. We're uh, bypassing their own judgment. And if they know best, as Mill typically thought people do, then there's a risk there's going to be a welfare loss, because we're not saying, what do you want? We're saying, you know, we kind of know, and we're going to incline you in that direction. OK, uh, bypassing people's deliberative capacities excessively does count as manipulative on that view. Influences ought not to be that, at least presumptively. If the influences are transparent and unhidden and subject to the scrutiny and review of the recipient, then the objection from the standpoint of manipulation is weakened either on the ground that the thing doesn't count as manipulative at all anymore, or on the ground that even if it has a manipulative dimension, there's some sort of consent and approval on the part of the recipients. I'll give you a little bit of data that's just emerging these months that is very striking, which is there's some concern that default rules can be manipulative. I'm not sure whether they fit within the definition, but at least it can be said that some default roles don't engage people's deliberative capacities. They just say, you're in the program, whether you want to be or not. Uh, if people are explicitly informed that a default rule has been chosen, and it's been chosen because it's effective, would you think the effect of the default rule would be weakened? The standard view by some really superb philosophers is that nudges of that kind depend for their effectiveness on covertness. That if you tell people what's going on, then, the, then it will unravel. Okay? And that's stated as an empirical fact in at least one quite famous paper. It's false. It's an empirical claim that's not true. Disclosure of the existence of the default rule, which may be mandatory on ethical grounds, I think it probably is, and disclosure of the reason for the effectiveness of default rules, which shouldn't be hidden and might be mandatory, at least someplace on ethical grounds in a democracy, that does not weaken the effect of the default rule. It stays where it was. OK, so uh, empirically, I now have data from a bunch of countries which suggests that people dis object to nudges when they dislike them on the merits, not because they are nudges. Do they object to default rules? No. Do they object to covert nudges once they're informed about them? Sometimes. But the basic proposition is there seems to be an ethical concern in democracies about mandates and taxes as instruments of policies, which is independent of the policy goal of the mandate or the tax. Mandates and taxes raise hackles as such. People will support them sometimes, but the tool is concerning. Choice-preserving tools? No. 
We're not getting data to that effect. It depends on the end. OK, dignity. On one view, the problem with paternalism, at least in some forms, is that it's humiliating or dis disrespectful to people. That's a kind of Kantian concern. Uh, a GPS device or a warning and a reminder, you'd have to get very, I think, clever to make an argument those are humiliating or disrespectful. Um, choice requiring paternalism itself can be taken as a, an affront to people's dignity if you're requiring them to choose in circumstances in which they want not to. So mandatory choosing or even influence in favor of choosing in circumstances where people don't want that, that's uh, objectionable. It is true learning can be really important and there's a risk of error on the part of the choice architect. Both points that may argue in favor of active choosing or improving people's capacities, those are forms of choice architecture and they may be the preferred forms. Okay, there is a view that suggests that nudges and related influences can't be distinguished as sharply from coercion as theory suggests. It's a very important point that if you all are defaulted into 12 things tomorrow, unless you hate them, and even if possibly you do, it may be the majority are going to stick. Not because you're OK with them, but because you've got other things on your mind. And on that view, the risk of at least some forms of influence is that they are choice preserving in theory, but coercive in practice. And the idea there would be that this is alarming. There's evidence that suggests that if low-income workers are defaulted into savings plans, they're quite likely to stick, more so than high-income workers. That may be good, but it may be an alarm bell suggesting that low-income workers who need the disposable cash are either over-influenced by the choice architect's suggestion or just so busy with other things that are more important that they're going to live as if the default rule is a mandate. OK, that's a problem. Insofar as certain nudges are exploiting cognitive biases, uh, there's a reason for concern. A good question is, what's the alternative? That's not a rhetorical question. The alternative might be an opt-in default rather than an opt-out default. And that might be better if the opt-out default is like a mandate, and it might be less likely to damage people. It might be the alternative is active choosing. And that would be a solution to this possibility in circumstances in which the force of the default rule is causing a, a problem for people. OK, fifth problem, who is the choice architect? I confess that of the various ethical objections to choice architectures, I would put this one kind of toward the top of the list of the ones that are forceful and worth engaging. And this would be at the bottom of the list. This would be the rhetorically most uh, kind of uh, provocative, but the, on reflection, least powerful. OK, so parents, teachers, bosses, cell phone companies, computer companies, providers of energy, stores, governments, deans, doctors, lawyers, they are all choice architects. So what's the question about? The list is very long. Uh, the question seems to be about distrust of the choice architect and who is the choice architect means you know, who are you to be architecting people's choices? Which is a fair question, meaning the person should be humble. But the, the universe is so large that it can't operate as an objection to the existence of choice architecture. Inevitably, those and a thousand and one more are choice architects.
So the question seems to be an objection to the enterprise when it's instead a plea, I think, for constraints on self-dealing or ignorance. And that's a good plea. Markets and democracy are imperfect, but important safeguards against harmful or self-interested um, choice architecture, which means, and now there's an important point, we need a choice architecture for choice architects. And with respect to government transparency and openness, elections are two. With respect to credit card companies, well-functioning markets, that's another. But it may be that sometimes markets incentivize rather than disincentivize self-dealing. OK, illicit ends. Uh, some nudges are illicit, helping interest groups, entrenching the current government, promoting discrimination, promoting unfreedom. In countries that are not dedicated to self-government or the welfare of their citizens, we can specify this list. In democracies, certainly some of these play a significant role. And the problem lies in the illicit ends. OK, the, the idea of learning is very important. And so this slide is a little more tendentious probably than it should be. Uh, choice making is a muscle, and it's strengthened through exercise, and it atrophies if it's not used. So there's a study of London cab drivers that suggests that uh, as they learn to navigate streets, something actually happens in their brain. Their brain shows what they have got. And if GPSs are in use, as I'm confident they are in London, that choice making muscle isn't being strengthened, and the brains aren't showing that stuff. So default rules might be worse than active choosing on this important ground. It's not quite Kantian. It's more, I think, straightforwardly a welfarist point that we would want forms of choice architecture that boost people's capacities rather than steer them easily in directions that make their lives go well. So there's a very interesting research uh, body emerging on a category called boosts as opposed to nudges, where boosts are understood as interventions that improve people's capacity for agency and don't kind of steer them in the welfare-promoting direction. A financial literacy program would be a boost. Automatic enrollment in a good plan would be a nudge on that view. It's probably right to see boosts as a species of nudging, not as an alternative. But that's just a form of semantics. It doesn't really matter. It just, just suggests an important point about domains where, on welfare grounds, we want people to learn. Okay, what makes this slide kind of too tendentious is the second, the last two bullets. Do we wish the GPS device had never been invented, that the printing press did not exist? Uh, there was some work when the printing press was created saying this is a problem because people aren't going to memorize anymore. And uh, that probably isn't, all things considered, a good objection to print. Uh, but it is true that there are cases where uh, learning is a decisive argument in favor of forms of choice architecture that promote that. OK, here's an area where we need much more work, I think. This is really at its earliest stages. And name your country, it could be your favorite democracy, where the uh, practice or even the theory of rights protection is a work in progress. And the question is, what forms of choice architecture might be helpful? I'll give you one very mundane example. Uh, several states in the United States, unbelievably, this is really recent, automatically register people to vote. You don't have to sign up. In California and Oregon, if they know you're of age, you have a driver's license, you're a voter. And what's fantastic about that is it's making hundreds of thousands of people, possibly millions, uh, giving them the franchise by default. You don't have to register with the authorities to have freedom of speech or freedom of religion. Is there a set of rights where this kind of uh, tool automaticity could be engaged that we haven't thought about yet. I bet. I bet there are some. Uh, so some nudges help to promote rights and make their realization possible. 
With respect to equality, self-government, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, we need much more thinking about that. Okay, I have two questions for you before uh, hearing what you have to say. Okay, so here's, here's the quiz. What's the most precious commodity that members of the human species have? A commodity that the liberal tradition has said far too little on, one that Hayek and Mill were almost silent on, and they wrote a lot. Time. Last question, what's the one thing that public officials, lawyers, doctors, and critics of nudges most often neglect? What's their shared blind spot? Peace of mind. Thanks. I know everyone's going to be asking a question, so you don't want to be the only one who's not. I kind of feel bad to violate the norm. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I'm going to start things off with a dumb question. So um, you quickly dismissed the choice of choice architects thing, and I wonder if you could say a few more words on this. It, I feel like there's a world in which we have trustworthy, responsible choice architects, which we would be thankful of most nudges and even give them a little bit of latitude to make mistakes. But I could, in another world where we don't trust the choice architects at all, wouldn't we want to just turn nudges off entirely? OK, thank you for that. So uh, I, I agree that what I said was too uh, quick and obscure and inadequate on this. So the question, who are the choice architects, could be taken in multiple ways. One way is we want to have choice architects who are trustworthy. And we need to have institutional safeguards to ensure that. That's a completely fundamental point. And to give a, a few examples that are just homely for me, meaning I know them. Uh, the, the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs, where I work, has a website called reginfo.gov where you can see all the regulations under review. You can see whether they're economically significant or not, and you can see how long they've been under review at OIRA. And by you, anyone with an internet connection can see that. That's choice architecture for choice architects. That is constraining on the institution. And there's cost-benefit analyses that are generated by multiple agencies by executive order. That's a form of choice architecture for the choice architects. So, to devise mechanisms like that is super important. Okay, you could take it a, a second way, which I think is the, the burden of your question, which is that the justification for distrust of fallible choice architects are, is, is a reason to abandon choice architecture as such. Now, there's one problem with that, which is the water story. And that's a fundamental problem. It's not possible to eliminate choice architecture as such. It's not possible to eliminate nudging, even by human design. So whether maybe we can bracket as that's OK, that's not something people are for, have done. But insofar as, uh, let's say, a government has a website and has an office and has forms with which it communicates with people, it's going to be engaged in choice architecture. Now, you might say, OK, those forms of nudging and choice architecture, which are inevitable uh, features of the activity, cannot be ruled out of bounds. So all the question means is that uh, choice architects' fallibility uh, is a reason not to allow a choice architecture except where it's inevitable. So no non-inevitable choice architecture. That's a logically possible position. It depends on extravagant assumptions, maybe, about uh, uh, welfare and autonomy in a world without choice architecture and welfare and autonomy in a world with choice architecture of the optional sort, if you're with me. Now, the assumptions I say are extravagant, meaning they're most unlikely, but they're not theoretically out of bounds.
if we thought you know markets that don't have those forms of government choice architecture that are not inevitable, that don't have any optional one, that lives are going to be great, people are going to be free, and their welfare is going to be high. And then once government starts doing what? Putting calorie labels on menus or warning people about, uh, uh, about uh, smoking or having default rule, incentivizing default rules, everything is going to be worse. It's possible that's true, and you know, but it would be surprising if government disclosure requirements would be better excised from government's toolkit. It's possible, but given the fact that uh, you can think of disclosure requirements which have produced very substantial benefits, it would just be surprising. So there's nothing, no a priori arguments there. You could say that. And if you were worried about choice architects, I think the idea that nudges or the influences we're discussing would be your first target, that'd be mandates. You'd be after mandates. You wouldn't want tax incentives. You wouldn't want criminal penalties. Now, of course, you'd want them for conduct that is, by general agreement, unacceptable. But you'd want to rethink the social security mandates. You wouldn't want to rethink the fuel economy label. The fuel economy label would relatively innocuous. The requirement that you get uh, a prescription before having certain drugs, that's more, I, I'm not opposed to that, by the way, but that would be a, a, a more natural target if you were worried about the choice architects. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering what transparency means in, for example, the case of the letter sent to the doctors um, or to the taxpayers. OK, great. So uh, in a case of a randomized controlled trial, uh, transparency probably means only after the trial you disclose towards everyone what you did. So in terms of the big policy interventions, transparency means A, disclosure that you're doing it, and B, disclosure to the public of why you're doing it, including a disclosure of a behavioral motivation if there is one. If you're doing a randomized trial, it is true you might pollute the trial. If you say to the doctors, you might not, and the default rule data suggests you might not. But if you say to the doctors, people are influenced by the social norm, we're telling you about the social norm, then it wouldn't be a fair trial anymore. So to have randomized trials in which there isn't transparency about everything that's ethically OK, I think, uh, so long as after the fact, nothing is hidden. Yeah. Thank you. What's the appropriate way for thinking about risk when we're designing choice architecture, or especially I'm kind of thinking of opt, uh, opt out provisions when, uh, when when I joined the government, I was given a thrift savings plan, and the default was uh, that I was enrolled in what they call the G fund, which basically kind of keeps me at the rate of inflation. Uh, I don't think there's any financial planner who would say the long term that's the best choice, but then you get into a situation where if you make any other choice for me, then you're opting me in to additional risk. Uh, so what's the appropriate way to think about that? That's a great question. Um, Probably you'd want the experts to be defaulting people into what is, in terms of expected value, uh, the best approach, and, uh, given historical trends, building in maybe a degree of conservatism. So uh, to get a little more specific, the one that the Harvard experts favor is uh, an index fund with a t target date. and. Uh, the general view is that that's the best on aggregate for people. Now, if people are once informed more risk averse than that, then they should have an option to opt out. But this is just a way of saying that the government selection that you describe seems you'd have to have an extremely high degree of risk aversion to favor that, and that that would be it would be hard to defend over the course of a lifetime for people to have that. They're, they're losing money under too many of the expected scenarios. 
Thank you. Do you think that choice architects within government have any cognitive biases of their own that come up when they're trying to compensate for the cognitive biases of others? Whether positive or negative, I know they're usually no, well-intentioned. No question. So I'll, I'll give you an example of one. And since government is uh, has su multiple actors, it's not even simple to describe a median public official. But let's talk about Congress. So within Congress, there's a great risk of availability bias, where I'll give a relatively recent example. Uh, many members of Congress were uh, more than alarmed about the risk of Ebola in the United States. And that was at a time when more Americans had married Kardashians than had died of Ebola. And people weren't thinking, oh my god, I might marry a Kardashian. And th the reason is, while Kardashian marriages are relatively salient to members of Congress, Ebola death, there was one I think, very, very salient. So if you have an example that is available in your mind, you'll inflate probability judgments. And Congress really does that in thinking about social problems. And it's not, it's kind of a case study in the use of the availability heuristic. They're not to blame, they're generalists. And uh, to run statistical uh, studies or even define them isn't what you do if you're a member of Congress, you're hearing stuff. And if you hear something about something that went terribly wrong, you might think, the probability of that is going to be really high. So availability bias is, is a, a big risk in the legislature. Speaking of the choice architecture for choice architects issue, we, the executive branch is far less vulnerable to that. And I think the one who gets the credit is President Reagan with the uh, executive order he issued his first month, executive order 12291, which says we're only going to do regulatory stuff if the benefits outweigh the costs. And that is a very uh, helpful discipline on behavioral biases. There are others which are uh, one that I think executive and legislative officials are all potentially vulnerable to. Confirmation bias, where you read information in a way that's consistent with your pre-existing beliefs. It's a little like the good looks, bad looks stuff, where if something is supportive of your beliefs and suggests you were even you were directionally even less right than you thought, yeah, I believe that. Suggests the direction of your belief is not right. It's very hard to um, uh, reject that. So within Congress in particular, the information filtering based on antecedent convictions, there is a rational account for that, which is they're doing some good Bayesian updating given their priors, but I don't think that's accurate. I think it's, it's motivated reasoning. And the executive branch is not immune from that. Yeah. Um, I've, got a question. I've got a question about um, perceptions of paternalism and the question of baselines. And uh, I'd like to use an example, which maybe some people are familiar with in law students. Um, Certain professors don't allow the use of laptops in class. Um, and one can argue that's arguably paternalistic on behalf of the professor. Uh, there was a professor that was asked about this charge of paternalism, and uh, he answered that, um, according to the student's argument, the school might as well put live TV shows up in the classroom and then have the student decide whether to listen to the class or watch TV. <laughs> I'll, I'll preserve more choice on that for the student. And I think of that the professor's point, similar to your, your point about there's inevitably going to be choice architecture, and the fact that the school decides to provide Wi-Fi um, uh, means that there's some choices going on. The professor should have the ability to uh, further uh, be an architect of that choice. Um, but I wonder more about the student's um, question of, uh, in terms of baseline, where uh, the baseline is that there's Wi-Fi, but there's for some reason no baseline, that, at least in perception, that there shouldn't be TVs on the wall. How do you think about um, uh, how does baseline, how should that factor into when you think something is being too manipulative or too materialistic? Okay. I, I think, I'm not sure it's a great, a deep question. I think offhand that the judgment of whether something is manipulative should be baseline independent. And the and I think that it, I have like 60 to 
percent confidence that's doable. That uh, to say um, uh, uh, everyone I know who is in uh, who is just a really happy person does X. That's manipulative, regardless of whether I'm trying to convince you to do what you're already doing or to do something different. Or at least it's arguably manipulative, because I'm trying to bypass, let's stipulate, your deliberative capacities and get your the conformity pieces of the brain all energized. Okay, so I think that the, the notion, I'll give you something that's more straightforwardly manipulative. Use relative risk information as opposed to absolute risk information. I think that's fairly count as manipulative. So to say, if, if you do X, you will uh, double your risk of mortality. Whereas the fact is, if you do X, you increase your chance of mortality from 0.001 to 0 0.002. The double your risk of mortality, that bypasses deliberative capacities and gets you all, I'm gonna die. But in fact, there is dying. And whether I'm using relative risk information to convince you stay with the current baseline or change, it wouldn't matter. I think I'd like to say that that's also true of paternalism, that, uh, that if there's a, a, a paternalistic effort, let's stipulate, to defy existing behavioral baselines, it doesn't become less paternalistic or more paternalistic by virtue of that fact. So that the, our working definition of paternalism would be overriding people, overriding or influencing uh, people's judgments about what's best for them on the basis of a belief that they don't know as well as you do. That's paternalistic. So in that view, a GPS is relevantly paternalistic. It's influencing and attempting to override your own judgment on the ground that it knows best. Now, that, it's means paternalism rather than ends paternalism, it's respecting your preferred destination, still paternalistic. Offhand, the, the baseline would not be, uh, would not be, it's an orthogonal issue, what's the baseline to paternalism? I say that without a lot of confidence, but I, I think that's right. Okay, folks, I think we're out of time for today. Uh, again, on behalf of the library, I thank you for coming to our, our talk and thank you, Professor Sunstein, for very interesting comments. We haven't heard before. And um, I'd like to remind you that the coop is right outside the door with books for sale. And Professor Sunstein will be here to sign them. Thank you very much. Thank you.